First project I'd like to talk about is Fusarium Head Blight project that causes annual damage of over a billion dollars and is caused by the pest Fusarium graminarium and affects small grains such as barley, wheat, and oats. Total addressable market is over $960 million. $290 million of damages are in the U.S. every year, and the main fungal pathogen uh, in the U.S. is Fusarium graminarum. Fusarium not only damages the grain, but also produces mycotoxins that stay associated with the grain after harvest. Mycotoxins are harmful to humans uh, and animals, and they're regulated in the food pipeline. We're taking uh, two stackable approaches to control fusarium head blight. One of those approaches is targeted reduction in DON synthesis, so reduction in mycotoxin synthesis, as well as a sidal approach where we're targeting essential genes within the fungus that negatively affect growth and development. The way we start out this project is in the lab. We're doing liquid culture and growing the fungus in liquid culture, 96 well plates. These plates have growth medium. We inoculate that growth medium with the fungi and then also with the double-stranded RNA. We incubate that material for a period of time. And then we use a special machine to acquire an image and use image analysis software to convert that image into something that we can score. As you can see on the panel in the left, we have an untreated control that's acquired by the machine and then is processed and you see the gold area is, is where fungal hyphal growth is taking place. Then the bars on the right are standardized percent control relative to the untreated, so bigger bars are better. The first bar on the left is a treated chemical control, which reduces growth by approximately 95%. And then the rest of the bars in the graph are green light proprietary sequences that we're evaluating for toxicity to the fungal strain. And as you can see, some of those genes triggers provide greater than 40% control of the fungal species. Once we get the data from the lab, we want to move as quickly as we can to on-plant assays. So we have a seedling-based assay that we run in the lab where we co-infect the fungus and apply the double-stranded RNA to the seedlings. We place those seedlings in a Petri dish uh, and allow those seedlings to grow and germinate. And then once the seedlings grow and germinate, we can look at the impact on the seedling as well as take pieces of that seedling and analyze them to understand what the production of the mycotoxin is in each of those different parts of the seedling. The picture on the left uh, is a picture of our seedling assay and untreated control and then the chart on the right is showing reduction of Don in the blue color and then reduction of disease in the green color. And as you can see from the bar on the far right, it's a fungicide control. Again, percent relative to negative control, bigger bars are better. Uh, some of the green light sequences are demonstrating 25 to 50% reduction uh, of Don production, as well as significant uh, decrease in fungal growth. Clearly, we validated at this time that both approaches, Don reduction and fungicidal activity, can be deployed as a way to control this pest uh, using double-stranded RNA. The next project I wanted to talk about was uh, pollen beetle, and pollen beetle is a pest of oilseed rape uh, only in Europe. There are a few alternatives to control pollen beetle at this time. All those alternatives are chemical alternatives, but many of them are being phased out due to concerns with non-target organisms such as pollinators. There's also pyrethroids, but there's widespread resistance. The current solution is endoxicarb, and it's under heavy pressure from the EU government as well due to environmental concerns. As you can see, the panel on the right is a oilseed rape field. The crop on the left has not been treated with an insecticide. The crop on the right has been treated with an insecticide targeting pollen beetle. And as you can see, more yellow in the field is better than the non-treated because each one of those yellow buds actually turns into uh, a seed crop and is harvestable. You can see in the lower panel on the right, there's an oilseed rape bud there. And you can see how the insect has moved up the bud and eaten the yellow petals off of each of the little flowers. And the only flowers that are gonna produce seed are the ones that still have the yellow flowers on them are not impacted impacted by the insect. As with our fungal pests, we start out initially in the lab. In this instance, we're feeding the pollen beetle uh, double-stranded RNA in a water droplet. So you'll see there's a little water droplet with the pollen beetle gathered around that water droplet. They will take a drink of that solution that contains the double-stranded RNA. We'll then put those insects on a diet plug to continue their development. And then we'll look at mortality throughout their developmental life cycle. As you can see on the right-hand side, we tested several genes. Each bar is an independent gene. 
and we looked at the level of mortality. The red bar is the control mortality, so anything above the red bar is a positive hit, and the bars with asterisks are significantly better than the negative control. As you can see, some of those bars are showing as much as 80 to 85% control of pollen beetle in this lab-based assay. So again, we wanna move as quickly as possible to a field-based assay. So those first sequences that are showing promise, we wanted to move to a lab-based plant assay. As you can see in the panel on the left, that's a canola plant. There's a perfume sprayer that has the double-stranded RNA. We're using that perfume sprayer to then apply double-stranded RNA to the canola plant. That canola plant will then be infested with pollen beetle. And again, we'll put that in a caged environment so the pollen beetle can't get out and allow it to feed on the canola plant. On the chart on the right, the, each bar represents a different gene that we're testing. And again, some of those genes are significantly better than the negative control, showing up to 45 to 50% mortality on the pollen beetle at day 12. Building on the success that we're having with the Varroa project, we're also looking at two-spotted spider mite. Two-spotted spider mite is a polyphagous pest in the greenhouse and field settings has rapidly developed resistance to current insecticides. And again, as with the varroa mite, this is an acaricide or an arachnid. And so we've already demonstrated that we can control with double-stranded RNA in varroa mite. We're now transferring this to two-spotted spider mite. Two-spotted spider mite is a pest of row crops as well as fruits and vegetables. 60% of yield loss can be attributed to two-spotted spider mite in the Western Great Plains of the U.S., especially on dry land corn conditions. And it also damages economically important crops such as grapes, as well as other fruits and vegetables. What you see on the right is a control bean plant or an uninfested bean plant. And what you see on the left is a bean plant that two-spotted spider mite has fed on. You can see the white spots down in the corner of the leaf. That's a chlorotic phenotype due to the mite feeding. And you can think of the mites uh, when they feed as, as taking a straw and kind of ramming it through the lid of the to-go cup and then bending down and kind of sucking the liquid out of the cup. Well, that's exactly how the mites feed on the plant. They take their mouth parts, they jab them into the cells of the plant, and they suck out the components uh, or the sap from the cells. And then as part of that, they take the chlorophyll along with it, and that leaves that white splotch, which uh, turns into chlorosis on the outside of the leaf. As with the other projects, we move sequences as quickly from the lab as we can to on-plant study. And we do this with two-spotted spider mite by doing a leaf disc assay. We core the leaf disc out from the bean plant, we apply double-stranded RNA topically to that leaf disc, and then we infest that leaf disc with two-spotted spider mite. And as you can see in the bottom panel, we have a mite where it has not been treated with double-stranded RNA or it's a negative control. You see the characteristic dark two spots on either side of the mite. And then if you look at the other two pictures of the mites, those are mites that have been fed on double-stranded RNA, and they show this characteristic darkening as they begin to die. The panel on the right shows mortality over time. And as you can see by day eight and by day 10, depending on the target, we're seeing 100% mortality of the females. And one of the things we're looking at females is because females can hatch and come to reproductive maturity in five days. They can survive for up to a month, laying several clutches of 100 eggs at a time. So it's not only the individual mites that are causing damage, but it's the population growth and how prolific they are in reproduction that they blow up in the fields very fast and cause significant damage due to that population growth. So one of the potential strategies to use for this project is also looking at reducing fertility and fecundity of the mites as well as providing cytal genes uh, that would target the mite for death directly. One of the biggest challenges uh, Greenlight is moving to have double strand control of a lepidopterans. To date, ingested double-stranded RNA uh, has not been a viable solution for lepidopterans due to their recalcitrant nature. We're actually looking at two of the lepidopterans, diamondback moth and fall armyworm. Both of these pests cause significant damage, especially in areas of tropical and subtropical regions where they have multiple asynchronous generations per year in those areas. And if you can think about those areas, they feed on multiple crops, they, they have multiple green spaces to go to. So somebody, like let's say in Brazil, may be harvesting a corn crop and right next to that corn crop could be a bean crop that's not yet 
been harvested so it's still green, could be a, a cotton crop that's next to that that's still green that those pests can move to and continue to feed. So they can cycle through uh, multiple generations in a year by moving crop to crop to crop in the different green spaces. So that creates intense pesticide use and weekly spray when the pests are present. There's also significant resistance out there for diamondback moth and fall armyworm. Most significantly, for diamondback moth to BT sprays of insecticides, as well as pyrethroids. And with the fall armyworm, resistance to GM crops that are no longer effective in countries such as Brazil and Argentina. Additionally, the LEPs have some significant challenges or barriers that we don't see with some of the other coleoptern pests. The double-stranded RNA has to survive a harsh midgut where there's a high pH. There's also several different digestive nucleases that work to attack that double-stranded RNA. It has to be able to move from that midgut environment into the cells of the midgut, and then the RNA has to be available at the site of action where the RNAi process takes place. So to help circumvent these barriers, Greenlight's evaluating several different types of delivery technology that impact the mortality of our double-stranded RNA sequences. And this is kind of illustrated on the panel to the left. The first two bars are when we actually inject the double-stranded RNA into the insect. So we've completely circumvented those barriers by injecting the material directly into the hemocil. The RNA is where it needs to be from a site of action standpoint. And you can see that there's high mortality from our target in the blue bar. The orange bar is a injected control. Uh, so then we took those sequences and moved them to a diet-based bioassay. Here we didn't see any activity whatsoever, or very limited activity in the diet-based bioassay. Uh, we wanted to then move them to a plant-based assay to see if there was uh, some impact of the diet that was causing the double-stranded RNA not to be active. And again, when we tested these on plant, we did not see any activity. As we started to think about the barriers and understand what some of these barriers are, we brought in delivery technology to evaluate its opportunity to help provide additional efficacy for the double-stranded RNA. As you can see on the panel in the left, the three bars at the end is double-stranded RNA with a coformulant. The orange bar is coformulant by itself. The dark blue bar is one gene target, and the light blue bar is a second gene target. And as I mentioned before, this is a project that has two pests in it, and we're really using what we learned from each of these pests to help benefit the other. So if you look at the blue bar in the far right panel, that is the same gene target in a different insect. So we're moving from diamondback moth to fall armyworm. We're using a different delivery technology for fall armyworm. And then we're looking at weight reduction. We're seeing a 90% weight reduction using a target that's active in diamondback moth, using that ortholog or homolog from fall armyworm and mixing it with a different delivery technology in the assay. And as you can see in the bottom, there's the insects from the non-treated control, as well as the very small insect from the material treated with the delivery technology complex with the double-stranded RNA. So we wanna to continue to optimize the delivery technologies to overcome these uh, barriers. And the next step would be to demonstrate uh, activity in the greenhouse uh, as quickly as we can. The next project I want to talk about is powdery mildew. Powdery mildew is the largest driver for pesticide use in viticulture. Where the powdery mildew is the biggest challenge is in California, as well as in Washington and Oregon. And there's a little spot in New York as well where powdery mildew is a problem. Powdery mildew is caused by Erysiphe necator, or necator, and it's an economically important pest. In California, they spray on an average of seven fungicide treatments are applied and it accounts for 74% of the total pesticide applications uh, by California grape growers. And that is 17% of the total pesticides applied in the California agricultural system. One thing about Erysiphe, it is an obligate pathogen, which means it cannot grow unless it's associated with the host. And it not only impacts the leaf, but it also impacts the fruit. You can see in the bottom left here, some diseased fruit from powdery mildew. You'll see on the bottom picture uh, on the right is the white splotches you see there are powdery mildew infecting the leaves. So not only does it infect the fruit, it also infects the leaves, which leads to a reduction in yield. Being that powdery mildew is an obligate pathogen, we have to do all of our testing on the leaf tissue themselves. And as you can see in the upper panel here, we do that similarly, core the leaf disc out, and then we look at observations over three different time points. So we infect that leaf disc, 
Once we get to a certain level of growth in the negative control, then we start to look at and score the double-stranded RNA triggers that we applied to the leaf discs. And we do that by taking a picture using an image and then use image analysis to transform that picture into what you see in the right panel here. The light spots are powdery mildew that are growing on the leaf disc. And not only do we get a single flat picture, but we also get multiple pictures sections down uh, from the top of the leaf surface to generate a picture like you see on the right here. Each one of those little stalks with circles on them, it kind of looks like a toothpick with an olive on it. Each one of those olives are actually spores that are going to be released by the growing fungus. So not only can we look at hyphal growth, but we can also look at, at spore production as well. These assays were done in collaboration with USDA Geneva, and we have multiple samples that are demonstrating activity on leaf disc. And you can see that by the graph on the bottom left. The red line is our negative control, and then anything above the red line are performing better than the negative control, and we want to advance. It's a percentage of hyphal growth, so a reduction in hyphal growth, so bigger bars are better. So you can see the initial time point, you see quite a bit of reduction, but then as the time goes on, you see less and less reduction in the fungal system. So once we get these results, we want to move to the field. And it's really important for us to ensure that what we're seeing in the lab translates to the field. And with powdery mildew, the results in the lab are consistent to what we're seeing in the field. So the bar chart you have here are field results, where we're looking at the untreated check in red, and we're looking at disease severity. So it's the coverage of the disease on the leaf surface. So higher bars are bad. So as you can see, the red bar there in the untreated check, you have close to 20% of the leaf surface covered by powdery mildew. And then you look at a couple different GL green light treatments. You look at once a week with GLB1 or twice a week with GLB1, and you can see uh, increased control with more applications. And then you have your chemical standard and your fungal standard on the right side of the graph there. On the right panels, the pictures, like I mentioned previously, it not only affects the leaf surface, but also affects the fruit. So you can see in the untreated check, the vines are brown, the fruit has a very brown tinge to it, as opposed to the nice and healthy bunch of grapes that are on the GL1 treated samples. This slide is another set of field results we have from a trial location in New York. And the untreated check is on the far left in the kind of darker striped bars. And then the GLB sequences are in the solid colors that were treated with once a week application. The striped colored sequences are a twice a week application with the GLB sequences. Last two bars are a chemical standard as well as a biological standard applied once a week. And again, we're looking at disease incidence in the, the top panel and disease severity in the bottom panel. So disease incidence is how many leaves have powdery mildew on them. And then disease severity is the percentage of that leaf that's covered with powdery mildew. And as you can see, GLB 43 sequence provides disease control equal to commercial standards at all weekly assessments. The GLB level of control progressed as the trial increased. Some of the GLB sequences, when applied twice a week, provided additional control compared to the once a week application. The interesting thing from this trial, and it's not really on the graph, is that the GLB demonstrated a greater level of control on the fruit than the commercial standards, and that was especially more evident in the two sprays a week. I think you saw that on the previous slide where we showed pictures of GLB-1 sequence and the fruit looked very healthy. So in summary, we've been able to demonstrate for these six insect pests that RNA is a viable solution, not only to control the pests, but there are also other avenues that we can look to mitigate the pest impact on the host. The Lepidopterum projects are focused on ensuring intact double-stranded RNA is delivered to the site of action, and we're doing that by evaluating several different delivery technologies, not only in what we're doing internally, but also from external partners. The fungal projects are advancing rapidly. Powdery mildew is demonstrating field activity, and we're looking at a phase gate advancement for that project, moving from proof of concept to proof of technology. And the fusarium concept is also moving quickly in our lab-based assays, and we're looking forward to advancing that onto the greenhouse as quickly as possible. The other thing I'd like to mention here is collaborations are, are critical to our early success. So we are working with external either university partners, CROs, or other companies to bring in technology that's going to speed product development and get the products to market quicker.